Hey there, this is Mike and you're listening to Feeling Twisty. I'm really glad you're here. I want to share a couple of quick stories with you. Uh, I like the ease with which these two women moved in imagination to fulfill their desires. The first story comes from a woman in South Africa. She'd gotten word that her brother, who lives a good distance from her, was very sick, and she was initially filled with worry about it for her brother. But she remembered hearing a story I shared about my son's missing wallet and how I told him that he'd find it because I already heard him tell me he found it in imagination. So she did the same thing. In imagination, she heard her brother's voice on the phone telling her how much better he feels. She says, I felt the relief that came with that imaginal act, the relief of hearing him tell me that he's feeling better. She says she went on with her day with a lightness and relief, doing what she wanted to do, watching movies and having fun, knowing that it's done. The following day, she heard from her brother and heard what she had imagined. He was feeling great. Now, she didn't tell me what the brother had, if there was an official diagnosis or not, and I didn't ask because that doesn't matter. You know, what thrilled me the most about her story is how she ended the email. She's on fire for exploring the power of imagination for herself and her loved ones. I know I'll be hearing from her again soon. She recognized the worry that she was feeling, and instead of sinking down into that and imagining up all the ways this could get worse for her brother and his family, she turned within and heard what she wanted to hear. This next story is from a Louisiana woman who was ready for a new set of wheels. I've spoken with her many times over the last few years, and I get so thrilled when I hear from her. In my opinion, she's kind of a badass when it comes to manifesting, and she does everything with love. She always has beautiful stories to share with me. In this one, she writes, all of a sudden, I found myself feeling frustrated with a couple of our vehicles. They had issues and were in need of new paint. I was grateful to have the vehicles because we needed them and they're paid off. Looking at the budget, I didn't really know how to get another vehicle. Then I decided to just imagine our driveway filled with nice cars. Still did nothing purposely other than that. One of my children wanted a specific car, so I decided to look for one. I didn't find that one, but I came across one of the exact cars I had imagined. And now it's ours at an amazing price. This was just a couple of weeks from seeing it in imagination to sitting behind the wheel of my new car. She says she noticed that she changed the way she thought of herself first and the desire to get the new vehicles and the solution to that, turning within, easily came from this new state, this new concept of self. She changed her state. She realizes that the desire for the new cars came from that new state of consciousness. And from that new state, she imagined her driveway filled with the cars she wanted. And from that new state, she imagined her driveway filled with the cars she wanted. Now, neither of these women asked anyone else for permission or wondered if they deserved what they wanted. They appropriated it in imagination. Neville Goddard says to subjectively appropriate the state desired. In uh, Imagination Begets the Event, he says, what would you like to be in this world? Begin to imagine as if it were true. Know what you want, then cease wanting it and appropriate it. Begin now to imagine it's true. That is subjectively appropriating the objective hope. We do it subjectively, imagining, feeling it to be true now. We appropriate that feeling in imagination. It's so easy to get caught up in all the reasons why the thing desired is going to be difficult to achieve. Maybe I don't deserve it. Neville would say, stop thinking about deserving it or being worthy. What do you want? <laughs> Appropriate means to take without permission. I don't mean 
go out and swipe something from somebody else, take it in imagination, move into that state without getting permission from anyone or worrying about deserving it or being worthy of it. If you wait around for others to decide whether or not you deserve something, you'll be waiting a while and continue living under the thumb of these imagined powers outside of yourself. Don't hold back. Think of what you want and bump it up. <laughs> like Emerald Lagasse says, let's kick it up a notch. <laughs> Bam! Don't limit yourself when it comes to what you want. Live boldly. Imagine boldly. You don't have to just imagine getting by or imagine a small amount of something. Well, this is all I need. No, push through these barriers that we set up for ourselves, these expectations from family and tradition and society. What do you really want? Appropriate it. Feel the reality of already having it, being it within you. And no one's going to be hurt by what you're imagining. There's plenty for all of us. <laughs> it's unlimited resources. By imagining something wonderful for yourself, you're not taking from someone else. You're not hurting anyone else. If I find myself wondering or worrying about a particular desire and the possibility of it actually happening, then I know I'm not remaining loyal to the unseen reality. I'm not remaining loyal to that imaginal act. And that lack of faith springs from my state. And that state is a misidentification of self. Neville quotes William Blake often. He says, man is all imagination and God is man and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. Both of the women in these stories remained loyal to their unseen reality. They put their complete trust in the imaginal act, in themselves, their inner being. When I'm imagining, God is imagining. When I'm lost in fear and worry, God is lost in fear and worry. When I'm imagining I'm sick or broke, God is imagining it's sick and broke. That's you. And the imagination leads. It always leads. This power, regardless of what you want to call it, isn't something we turn off and on as needed. It's always on. <laughs> I really like how Neville describes it in the lecture, The Coin of Heaven. You are standing forever in the presence of an infinite and eternal energy. And from this energy, all things proceed, but they proceed according to pattern. You are this infinite and eternal energy. And it never stops being. <laughs> this energy never stops energying. <laughs> what you are imagining shapes the patterns that take form in three dimensions. We walk along this path. Neville calls it a circular path, going round and round, repeating the same stories and the same circumstances, railing against all who oppose us, blaming everyone blaming our families, our in-laws, our bosses, the government, instead of changing the patterns that we're forming, changing what we are imagining. You cannot turn this off. You can't stop imagining. I've got an idea. This isn't what I'd planned, but let's try something. You don't have to close your eyes for this, but go ahead if you want to. Not if you're driving. Don't do that. But let's just let our hold on today's happenings loosen a little. This is just for fun, a little exploration, no pressure. Let's explore love. Early on, I would hear Neville talk about love. And of course, I read about love in the Bible. I grew up reading about it. God is love. You know, there's a song about it. We made a song at Vacation Bible School out of... Uh, the verses in 1 John. But what I learned in church seemed to contradict itself. 
They told me God is love and God loves me, but if I don't say the right phrase, he's going to toss my butt in the perpetual lake of fire. And then all the judgment. Sure, God is love and we are supposed to love, but not if you have piercings in the wrong places or tattoos or drink or curse or date the wrong people or love the wrong way. This unconditional love I kept hearing about didn't seem so unconditional. When I first started doing this exercise, if you want to call it that, a few years ago, I realized I had a splintered idea of love. And we use the word so often. We love stuff on Facebook. And hell, I say love a lot. I love Star Wars. I love Star Trek. I do. You can love them both equally. <laughs> I love my kids and my wife. But I knew there was more to it. I had this longing, this craving for this deep, infinite love that I knew was there. Or here, rather. I knew it was here. But it felt like I wasn't feeling it. I wasn't actually experiencing it. Yeah, yeah, unconditional love. But what does that feel like? So one day I got quiet and just ask myself, how does unconditional love feel? I can define it, but what does it feel like? I wanna feel it. And in a few moments, <laughs> I felt something uh, I'd never felt before. I should say it was a feeling that I had lost all memory of feeling before because in those moments, it felt like memory was returning. When I put that question to myself, how does unconditional love feel? Love responded. And it was unending, limitless, unconditional, requiring nothing from me. Even though it seemed like a separate being or presence at first, I felt the recognition of my true self. And love is as close as I can get to defining it. <laughs> I started crying tears of joy Gee whiz, I want to use my words here, but there aren't any to really get across everything that was going on in those moments. You'll experience it too, if you haven't already, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's love. What does love really feel like? Ask yourself, how does unconditional love feel? How would I feel to be loved unconditionally? Hmm. The answer will come. Love responds. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. That's my favorite verse in the Bible because it covers it all. That's God talking and God is love. God is my awareness of being or imagination as Neville would call it. Call to me and I'll answer. So, let me experience unconditional love. There isn't a special breathing technique or, or any technique required here. Nothing more special than you just being you and allowing love to well up within you. Mm. Love. Now, you may have some things pop up in your mind, reasons why you don't deserve love, your present situation or your past. Well, don't fight it. Don't try to fight those things. Just let those things, those thoughts be there. They aren't you. They're just results of your state of consciousness. In this moment, we're loosening our grip on that state from which those thoughts come. And we're falling back into this endless and this wonderful, unconditional love. It's the first principle. Be still and know that I am God. Be still, loosen my grip. And remember that I am love. Because God is love. I am love. You are love. Remember, I don't consider myself a teacher or a coach. I'm just you <laughs> reflecting back to you.
But try this. Instead of ticking off all the things on your manifesting to-do list today, dwell in the feeling of love. Hmm. I'm telling you, prepare yourself to have your mind blown at the wonders that will come from this. And I do love you. I'm feeling twisty.